So I read two articles this morning alone, and I'm sure if I go back a couple of days or a couple of weeks, I could count out hundreds, to be honest, of housing hitting a wall, of the Fed wrecking housing. The Fed wants to kill homeowners and homeowner equity. I mean, this is a conversation that went deep this weekend on Facebook on a post that I made. And the Fed had made a statement that first time home buyers and young people, I don't know why he parsed those out, but it's irrelevant. Sometimes he goes on a tangent. Uh, but first time home buyers and young people, they need a reset button. That's what he said. And, and so, you know, it went into this whole thing. Well, he said a couple of other things. He's not saying he wants to kill homeowner equity. He's not saying that he's trying to destroy housing. He's not saying those specific things, but they're being inferred, of course, because we do that. We do that because the Fed talks in riddles and we have to sometimes decipher. You know, much like the comment that they were just figuring out how little they knew about inflation. If that doesn't freak you out, I don't know what would. They're the Fed and they only have two jobs. <laughs> One of them is controlling inflation. So I'm not going to go there. Somebody needs to, to nominate me is what I'm thinking so that I can take over the role. Uh, but God bless. I do still love uh, Mr. Jerome Powell, Fed Chair Jerome Powell. He brings me love, joy, and entertainment on almost a daily basis. But I read this article this morning, a couple of our two articles, in fact, and what was said specifically was that the Fed is creating a bridge period of demand exhaustion. That's what was said. So does that mean that the Fed is trying to kill the housing market? Because that's not what he said, <laughs> but it's what was inferred and I get that that's what is felt. The Fed is killing the housing market. But what he actually said was the Fed is creating a bridge period of demand exhaustion. So can we please, can we please for a minute go back one year? Can we think about the level of intensity that we all felt? Now, granted, I was crazy busy. Real estate agents listening to this were crazy busy. Lenders were intensely busy, right? Let's not say the word crazy too often. It starts making you crazy. But so we were intense. It was intense. The housing market was intense. Being a first time home buyer or a young person, because let's just throw that in, was intense because I, you can't get in. You can't afford a home that you have to put 25, 50, 100, 200,000 over asking on. And then what if the appraisal does come in low? Like right now, the most recent appraisal report for June, 5% of the appraisals came in low, which is dang near normal, right? Like we're, yes, appraisals come in low, markets get ahead of themselves, sellers get ahead of themselves, and there will always be a number on that chart. It's never gonna be zero. Sellers get ahead of themselves, they overprice, uh, they negotiate, and the appraisal comes in low. 5% is all it was in June. Last year, it was in double digits, right? And we were seeing it go up and up because we had to go up and up just to get a home. We had never seen that level of intensity, nor has the real estate market ever seen that kind of price growth ever in history. To see that elevation of price growth that quickly is not normal. We were saying it wasn't normal during that time. So it wasn't normal. It was unhealthy. It was savagely unhealthy, right? To quote Logan from Housing Wire, savagely unhealthy. It's an interesting word. It's like the Fed's killing the housing market. But so it was savagely unhealthy. It was unhealthy. Buyers couldn't get in. Sellers got super greedy. Own it, sellers, just for a second. Sellers got super greedy. They didn't want to leave a single dollar on the table and they wanted exactly what their neighbor got or more. They could, 
I mean, the market allowed for it. Why wouldn't you? If I'm going to sell something, why wouldn't I want to sell it as high as I could? I'm not blaming them. They took advantage of the market. Meanwhile, buyers struggled tremendously, more so than ever before. And at the same time, policies were coming out to devastate pricing. I mean, we had FHFA, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac doing things to pricing that it's like, really? Now? Now's when you want to raise the interest rates on cash out refinances so people can actually take advantage of some of this equity and continue to prosper and build wealth for their families? Now? Now is the time that you want to increase the interest rates on investments or second homes? Or now is the time that we want to increase the interest rates even just on investments? I mean, come on, FHA, you have so much money in the bucket from all of these lifetime mortgage insurances. Why don't we cut that, right? Why don't we do something positive so that a buyer could actually afford more home because mortgage insurance dropped? But no, everybody got greedy. Even the FHFA, they wanted theirs. They wanted theirs. They said in times like this, we have increased risk. So increased risk with all these, these low interest rates and massive amounts of equity, this increased risk justified these ho higher interest rates, right? And, and then the Fed was like, well, we, have, we don't know what risk we have in front of us, so we need to keep those mortgage insurance amounts high and healthy. Well, that's coming back to bite them because now buyers and volume is down, even for the government agencies that were living uh, high on the farm, right? So buyer demand is softening there was an increase in inventory here in the dmar market we saw an increase of inventory of almost double last year we're still not even touching 2019 right or even 2020 we're under 2020 we're well under 2019 and we're 80 percent lower than a normal balanced market now let me preface that with Denver doesn't have normal balanced markets. So that would be unfair to say that we're 80% less than what we should have because we just never have. We typically run, I don't know, four months of inventory, not six. So the 80% would be less than six months of inventory. We have one, 1.1 months of inventory. That is not an abundance of inventory that's going to cause this market to come crashing down. So the fact that the Fed is wanting to kill the housing market equals the Fed is creating a bridge period of demand exhaustion. I just don't put those two together. I get how people do. The Fed is trying to soften an incessant buyer demand. We could not get enough of anything. We couldn't get enough cars, houses, TVs, stuff delivered to our porch. I don't know if this was Colorado or the entire United States. I'm pretty sure it's just Colorado, but did you see that they just added a tax on anything that's delivered? That's going to happen. And that really upsets me because I really do love Amazon. And I'm sorry to say that out loud because I try to support local markets and I do. Uh, but I also love Amazon because I love it when I can order one thing like cotton swabs when I run out and they deliver it for free. <laughs> Lazy. That's what that is. Americans just continue to buy. We were incessant. We had a ton of money and everything cost very little. So bring it on. Even if you had to start raising the price, like, come keep bringing it on because I still feel pretty wealthy until this year, until this year, right? So 2020, 2021, I was feeling pretty high. And even, you know, you go back to 2010 to 2019, still feeling good. We were headed towards a recession entering into 2020, but we still felt good, right? The economy was still strong, but here we are now and it doesn't feel like it has for a while. So we equate it to the housing bubble. So that's where everybody's heads go. But this is so different because we have a ton of equity in our homes. We have a very strong economy considering. We have slowdowns. We have manufacturing slowdowns. 
We're slowly maybe seeing that the uh, inflation is slowing down back at the manufacturing levels, which will eventually hit the consumer levels. CPI comes out tomorrow. If it goes way up again, all bets off. <laughs> I'm just, ah, I'll be talking about that again tomorrow. But right now, I'm talking about what I'm feeling today. So as a housing market, we have almost little to no vacancies. There's no abandoned homes like we saw in 2008. Remember, nobody but nobody is going to sell a home at a 2.65, 2.75 interest rate with $150,000 in equity with a roof over their head. They're not going to sell it in panic to go rent. I mean, that's what you have to have. You have to have this flood of inventory enter the market. You have to cease all demand right in order to have this housing bus which usually comes with this massive economic turn of some kind right which we saw a bit of that during the pandemic we saw that in the housing bubble that was created due to the fact that we were giving loans to everybody who was breathing but that's not the case today that's not the case today in fact here in denver we continue to be incredibly strong our average credit score is 733 on average we're putting 23% down, 22% down. I'm citing that from memory. Black Knight puts out a report every single month. They update it every single month. And based on the last report, it's plus or minus a couple points. But on average, we put 22% down. We have a 723 credit score. 733, I just said, sorry. We have a really strong buyer pool is all I'm getting at. So we have a really strong buyer pool, not the kind of buyer we saw in 2006 who was taking advantage of the stated income, stated assets, are you breathing, you get a loan syndrome. So today we have a calmness of demand, a demand that the first time home buyers are feeling the brunt of this. Those who own a home that we're just going to sell their home to buy another home are thinking, I got a, I got a good deal. I got a lot of equity. I got a sub four interest rate. I don't love my home. I really want to get my kids into a different school district or I need a little bit more space, but I could probably wait until next year or the year after. So I'm just going to hold for a minute. All right. We didn't see an increase in inventory because we saw an increase in new listings. We did see an increase in new listings, but it was seasonal. We saw the increase in inventory because we saw the slowdown in demand because buyers have to second guess when their loan is going up. In fact, there was another article I read this morning talking about the fact that the homes that have been um, either having to be relisted or out of contract now is higher than it's been in five years outside of March of 2020, when I'm sure a lot of buyers decided to cancel that contract. But cancel contracts is now back up again because home interest rates are higher. And if you got under contract on Friday and you were quoted one interest rate and then Monday comes and that interest rate jumped, which we've seen a couple of times based on the CPI or the PCE or some other information that comes out and all of a sudden that home budget isn't working. So the first time home buyers need a reset, ultimately that has to happen. And the Fed increasing the Fed rate is going to do that. The Fed rate is not equal to mortgage rates. They are not sisters, but they are cousins. They are going to respond to the same economic factors. The Fed rate is going to impact the HELOC rates, the heat loan rates, the personal rates, the consumer loan rates, the car loan rates, those things, credit cards, right? All that consumer spending where people are trying to keep up with inflation right now, in essence, it's just costing them more. I swear, somebody just needs to nominate me, but it's not gonna happen. Not in my life. So housing is 40% of inflation. So you could say that if the Fed slows down house, housing price increases, then it will slow down inflation. And there's truth to that. It is also 20% of the GDP, of the economic output, right? So it's 20% of the economic output. So it's like, I want to slow down, but how much? They have to protect housing. They're not, we're not going to see a massive drop in prices. People just will simply stop selling. 
First time home buyers will struggle to get in at these higher prices, but please, please, please do, do get in because home prices, although will adjust because sellers wanted to continue selling at whatever their neighbor was selling for, and they simply can't do that. They have to realign with where that home was originally listed and determine what is the appreciation off of that number, not what is the appreciation off of the up bid number, right? That price that was the close over list. You can't take the close over list or the, the actual close and then want to price to that plus appreciation. You have to go to what it was listed before the crazy. Before the crazy. We got to get it back to a little bit. This is what we've been asking for for two years. Buyers could not get in and now they can. This is the door. This is the bridge. The slowdown of buyer demand is allowing the VA the FHA, the down payment assistance buyer to get back in. Now, can they afford as much as they could afford in 2019? No, no, unless they're making a ton more money, but no. And I get that and that hurts. But could I look at something a little different? If I can't afford the house I truly want to live in long term, could I afford someplace that I would want to rent out? Because interest rates eventually will calm. Now, how much lower do they go? My crystal ball is as fuzzy and cloudy as everybody else's. But in my core, I believe that the Fed is going to continue to do this until he push, they push, he, he, that was a 14 slip, until they push us into a recession. And if they do that, slowing economies bring lower interest rates. So if we do see the lower interest rates and a first time home buyer gets into a home that isn't fabulous, but it would make for a great rental, they could add an ADU, an auxiliary dwelling unit in the backyard. They could create a mother-in-law suite in the basement. Maybe they could separate it into two, or maybe it's just a five bedroom, four bath that they could rent out the rooms, house hack until they move on. Those are the opportunities. We've got to be thinking outside the box now, especially because I can increase your affordability using the rental income, the market rents on that ADU. That was the best news of the year, right? If I'm thinking outside the box and getting creative, I've got a lot of investors that are calling me right now saying, I can't make the numbers work. The interest rates are so high, my cap rate is really low. Yeah, yeah. But can you break even? Does this work? Now, I'm not, I wouldn't tell you to break even in any market. There are markets that just simply don't appreciate for any number of reasons based around their inflow of migration or their economic growth or the wage growth that they're experiencing or the education levels, on and on and on, right? There are markets that simply will be stable but not growing. Maybe markets that are unstable that might actually see a decrease in some values. The Denver market will continue to appreciate, even if we drop back for a second, which I don't actually think we will as a market, I think some sub neighborhoods will. But even if we drop back, we'll recover very quickly. But if we continue to appreciate, and if you're buying in the Denver market and you're buying an opportunity that has multiple rental incomes, you can't be looking in the Denver market just for cap rate because our home prices are too high. You've gotta be looking at it differently. I'm still in the market for helping my two sons buy their second home. I'd just like to get Gabby, my daughter moved into her home that we bought last November. God bless the Denver City Council because they can't get the permits out the door. Okay, so it took like five months to get a permit in Denver. If you wanna rehab, I'm not sure Denver's where you wanna be. Maybe any of the surrounding counties. I'm sorry, that was a personal jab. I just had to add it in there because she's still not in her house. So we're gonna get her in her house. We're gonna give the two boys a second home and I'm not going to stop buying. I'm not gonna stop buying because I believe in the housing market. I believe in the fact that we had another record breaking tappable equity growth in the first quarter of 2022. We have over 11 trillion in tappable equity. We have over 27 trillion in home ownership equity. So if that drops to 26, I'm not crying about that right? We have 0.1% foreclosures in Colorado. We have 1.7% delinquencies. We have next to no vacancies. We have an incredibly stable market. 62% of all homes have a loan. That means 38% are owned free and clear. They're not moving. 
They don't have to until things settle down. Or they'll move and they'll just buy with cash, right? The people that have loans, 75% are locked at 4% or under. We have an incredibly stable housing market. We gained more in equity in Colorado last year than our average wages. You made more as a homeowner than you did in your job. So if we lose three, five percent of that, we lost 11 percent in the Denver market in one year during the worst housing bubble in history. The other three years were all under three percent. I just don't see it. I don't see it. I think we got exactly what we've been waiting for for two years. Buyers take advantage of this. We, The Fed is not killing the housing market. The Fed created a bridge period of demand exhaustion. And will it hurt home prices? Yes, some of them it will, especially for those sellers who are trying to go above and beyond what they should be listing their home. It's never been more important to price your home right and to stage it well. And those crappy homes that were selling for a ton of money need to get an upgrade. Or bring in a buyer with a renovation loan. We're doing a ton of those. And I've got more DPA loans in my pipeline now than I have in the last two years. Thank goodness. Thank God. Home buyers, first time home buyers, young people, you have a chance. This is your bridge. This is the opportunity and the reset that you've been waiting for. Well, Nicole Ruth with the Ruth team, we hope to serve. Please give us a call. Start building your bridge to wealth. And I'll talk to you very soon. Bye-bye.